In front of the gaze of family and friends, a woman gave birth to a baby boy. It should have been a joyous occasion, but the father beside her remained solemn, unable to find any joy. As it turns out, in this world, there's a peculiar rule. Whenever a healthy child is born, someone close must take the place of the deceased. After bidding his daughter a final farewell, the elderly man approached the cliff's edge and took a leap. This is the premise of Helgoland, the latest disaster thriller series from Germany in 2024. Set in the year 2029, amidst a global pandemic of an unknown flu virus, infected individuals devour corpses like zombies. Those who survive have established a doomsday sanctuary on an island named Helgoland. To prevent infected individuals from sneaking in, they've erected a barrier using abandoned cargo ships and barbed wire. If warnings go unheeded, they don't hesitate to open fire. To prevent people from cheating and getting something for nothing, the leaders on the island created a points ranking system. Every resident has to contribute to the island through labor to earn points. If you end up at the bottom of the rankings, you could be eliminated at any time. That's why we saw that scene at the beginning, where the father sacrificed himself for his daughter by jumping off the cliff. But what nobody expected was that the woman was actually pregnant with twins, with another baby still inside her. This meant that another resident would have to sacrifice themselves. Leader Lisa called the higher-ups together because the woman only had her father as a relative on the island, and he had just ended his life by jumping off the cliff. Now, it was only her and the two babies left to depend on each other. So, the person to be sacrificed had to be chosen from the remaining 513 residents. Lisa asked everyone to come up with ideas on how to select the sacrificial lamb. However, the higher-ups held different opinions. One of them argued that they shouldn't be swayed by the woman's sympathy since she was not related to them, and in this apocalypse, everyone was struggling to survive. Who would sacrifice themselves for a baby in such dire circumstances? On the other hand, the doctor, Merrick, believed that a baby wouldn't consume much food during infancy, so having an extra one wouldn't matter. But Lisa countered that if they broke the rules for an unnecessary person, similar situations would likely occur in the future. In the end, they unanimously decided to vote to choose a sacrifice from the bottom three residents in the rankings. Watching the rankings on TV, Linus was shocked. He had recently flipped a truck accidentally during a mission, causing him to drop in the rankings to 511th place, which was third from the bottom. Linus was now at risk of being voted out. The second-to-last ranked resident was an elderly, lonely woman suffering from a mental illness. Although she hardly contributed anything to the island, she also didn't make any mistakes so the management didn't interfere much with her. The last-ranked resident was a repairman named Wendy's. He simply didn't report to work when he fell ill one day, resulting in his points being wiped out, landing him at the bottom. Fed up with it all, he decided to protest to the management. He worked tirelessly day and night, never expecting to end up in such a predicament. Wendy's pleaded with his wife to accompany him to the pregnant woman's house, urging her to give up one baby so that he could avoid being sacrificed by adopting a child. But his wife dashed his hopes, believing that in this apocalyptic world, nobody would bother to help each other. The next day, the residents, led by Lisa, gathered in the meeting hall to proceed with the vote. However, Linus didn't look dejected. Instead, he burst into laughter. It turned out that today was the day for the rankings to be updated. During his morning shopping, Linus deliberately shared an apple with the pregnant woman in front of Lisa, an act of kindness that Lisa noticed and rewarded with an extra point. So now Linus ranked fourth from the bottom. Lisa announced the start of the vote, with nearly half of the people voting for Wendy's, the last-ranked resident. Lisa declared that after the meeting, Wendy's would be sentenced to death. Wendy's slumped in despair on his chair. However, at that moment, his wife suddenly stood up to protest. It turned out that Lisa's son, Jim, took advantage of being the leader's son to bully many women on the island. The person who should be eliminated the most should be him. Stirred up by Wendy's wife, Many women who had been bullied by Jim stood up, accusing Lisa of abusing her power. Seeing the situation about to descend into chaos, Dr. Merrick stepped forward to defend Lisa, stating that they were acting according to the rules and would discuss how to deal with Jim after the meeting. But nobody bought it. If they continued to argue, Jim might affect their positions. So, Lisa reluctantly included her son among the three candidates and resumed the vote. To everyone's surprise, all the residents raised their right hands to sentence Jim to death. It seemed her son truly deserved it. As a mother, Lisa couldn't bear to execute her own son. Instead, she used her authority to banish Jim from the island, leaving him to fend for himself. Though this decision angered many present, no one dared to speak out against it. After all, 
The island's resources were controlled by these administrators. Before leaving, Marek's son approached him with a request to leave the island with Jim. It turned out they had been conducting research on virus vaccines on the island, but due to the outdated equipment in the lab, they needed to leave the island to develop the vaccine in the outside world. So Mark proposed leaving with Jim. Seeing his son's determination, Merrick reluctantly agreed to his proposal for the time being. Later that night, Merrick went to Lisa's villa alone, hoping to persuade her to reconsider her decision to banish Jim. He explained that as long as Jim didn't leave the island, his son wouldn't leave the outside world, which was too dangerous. However, Lisa didn't care about Marek's son at all. She had seen him raise his right hand during the vote earlier, so she wanted Merrick to experience the pain of losing a child just like her. The next day, Jim boarded the boat to leave the island, under the watchful eyes of the crowd, with Mark following suit. After some time, they stopped in a nearby city, where a soldier armed with weapons ordered Jim off the boat. Knowing he would quickly succumb to the virus once off the island, Jim begged desperately, offering to divulge secrets about his mother in exchange for his life. But the soldier remained unmoved, pulling the trigger and firing a shot into the ground, sending Jim fleeing in terror. With Jim gone, they didn't immediately return but instead sailed to another city, docking at a nearby port. Mia instructed Mark to stay put while they went out on a mission, promising to return soon. Then, they carried two heavy boxes and headed to the shore. After a while, they stopped near a bridge, where a yellow truck approached and a blonde man stepped out. It turned out there was another survivor camp outside. From their conversation, it's clear they've worked together before. The boxes contain fresh fruits and vegetables, much needed supplies in the city. As an exchange, the man produces a red medicine bottle with a vaccine label on it. It seems their relationship is more complex than imagined. While they exchange goods, a scruffy-looking old man suddenly emerges from the corner, claiming to be a mechanic who can fix various machinery if taken to the island. Before the man finishes speaking, he's shot dead by the blonde man's henchman. On their way back, Mia and her group carefully observe their surroundings, wary of any movement. However, as they pass a corner, an infected individual suddenly ambushes and tackles the overweight man from behind. From the old man's actions, it's clear he saw the overweight man as food. But before he could harm him, their teammate shoots him dead in time. During the scuffle, the overweight man's mask falls off, and although he quickly puts it back on, the virus has already spread into his body through the air. Back at the port, Mia realizes Mark isn't there. She considers waiting but her teammates on the boat refuse, unwilling to risk their lives for one person. They depart from the area on the speedboat. Meanwhile, Mark, while scavenging for supplies in the city, unexpectedly encounters a black man. From his condition, it's clear that Spark hasn't been infected. Spark tosses a bottle of vaccine to Mark, claiming they have plenty more of those vaccines, and he'll reveal their location if Mark takes him to the island. To verify Spark's claim, Mark follows him to a secret warehouse where it's pitch black inside. Carefully navigating to the deepest part, Spark retrieves numerous blue vaccines from a box. As Mark reaches out to take them, Spark turns on him, stating they have many companions, and if he wants the vaccines, he must take them along. Realizing he's been duped, Mark fires a shot into the air and quickly flees. Upon reaching the outside, he finds the speedboat has already left the port. Unable to dwell on it, Mark hurriedly follows the direction of the speedboat. Unexpectedly, an infected emerges from a corner. Using the butt of his gun, Mark knocks the infected unconscious and quickly continues running. Luckily, timing is on his side as he jumps onto the speedboat. Mark stands up panting, startling Mia with his torn protective suit, revealing it was damaged during the scuffle. Mia instructs Mark to stay where he is and not to approach them. Mark tries to explain but is hit with a tranquilizer dart. Before losing consciousness, he tightly clutches the blue vaccine in his hand. When Mark awakens from his coma, he finds himself in the laboratory on the island alongside the fat man who was also detained. Mark informs his father about the vaccine he found in the city, but Merrick seems unfazed, as if he had already anticipated it. It turns out that the soldiers who previously carried out missions also brought back vaccines, but most of them were fake. The survivors on the mainland are willing to do anything to infiltrate the island. Merrick assures Mark that he will find a cure to save him. Coming to the adjacent laboratory, Merrick, accompanied by his assistant, opens the two boxes brought back from the mainland. To their surprise, they find not supplies, but rather two survivors being held captive. It turns out they were involved in illicit dealings with the mainland. Merrick has been conducting live experiments on humans. Within a day, the infected fat man quickly loses consciousness and dies on the sickbed. 
With a vacancy on the island, Lisa decides to convene a meeting to announce opening up a slot to the outside world. Merrick suggests that his laboratory happens to need an assistant, preferably someone with medical knowledge. As they send this message to the outside world, the island's electrician overhears their conversation using a homemade radio. Since his wife hasn't obtained official residency on the island yet, he instructs her to read as much medical literature as possible, hoping she can pass off as qualified. Following her husband's instructions, the electrician's wife manages to pass the preliminary test. The most rigorous part, however, is yet to come, the interview. However, another woman, also a doctor, was admitted along with her. Merrick conducted a real-time question-and-answer session with both of them via video link. Perhaps due to nerves, the electrician's wife stuttered a bit during her responses, and in the end, the other woman passed the interview. Seeing his wife being rejected, the electrician decided to take everyone on the island down with him. He climbed up the wind turbine, smashed the island's power equipment, and then smeared lard on the staircase of a crucial pathway. When the maintenance worker went up, he slipped, and his right foot got stuck in the staircase. Luckily, he was discovered in time and rushed to the hospital. Merrick, being a laboratory doctor, wasn't skilled in surgery. At this point, his assistant thought the woman they just admitted might be able to help, so they decided to wait. But the maintenance worker's condition worsened rapidly, and delaying further could cost him his life. With no other option, Merrick performed an amputation as a last resort. Just as the surgery ended, unexpectedly, the recruited female doctor arrived, as if on cue. Merrick sensed something amiss with the woman and directly asked her what her true intentions were. To his surprise, she came clean, admitting that she was not a surgeon but rather an elementary school teacher. As for how she knew so much about medical knowledge, someone had leaked that secret beforehand. She claimed she meant no harm and was here to help him. Then she uttered the puzzling phrase, I am your shadow, leaving Merrick deeply perplexed, wondering if there was a significant figure behind her. However, before he could grasp the meaning, the assistant burst into the room, having overheard their entire conversation. Merrick attempted to explain, but the assistant shoved him aside. It turned out that she had been working as the laboratory assistant for years, and Merrick wouldn't even let her touch the equipment. All her actions were merely to prevent Merrick from replacing her position. Now that she had caught Marek's indiscretion, she intended to report their conversation truthfully to Lisa. Just as the assistant was about to leave, Fiona grabbed her by the hair and pinned her to the ground. With their true identities exposed, both she and Merrick would be in mortal danger, so the assistant had no choice but to die. After a fierce struggle, Fiona dealt with the assistant, and she and Merrick discreetly disposed of the body into the sea under the cover of night. The next day, Lisa visited the hospital room to check on the injured repairman, only to find the former assistant missing. Leaving a patient alone in the ward was a grave offense in the hospital's code of conduct, so Lisa decided to revoke all of the assistant's points. However, as she was about to leave, she unexpectedly found a dropped tooth at the door crack. The former assistant had never missed work in her years of service. Could this tooth be related to her? Realizing the gravity of the situation, Lisa brought the tooth to Marek's laboratory, demanding answers as to why he killed the assistant. To her shock, Merrick openly admitted that even if he had killed the assistant, so what? With him being the only doctor on the island, Merrick was confident that Lisa wouldn't do anything to him, but someone had to take the blame for the assistant's death. Just as it happened, the electrician was deliberately sabotaging the wind turbine, deserving punishment. So, Lisa conveniently pinned the assassination on him as well. The blood stains on his clothes became evidence, but the electrician was bewildered, having no connection to the assistant's death. He had no idea where Lisa got the assistant's blood. Then, Merrick added fuel to the fire, claiming that the blood stains on the clothes perfectly matched the assistant's DNA, making the electrician the murderer. Unable to defend himself, the electrician became a scapegoat, and after everyone's vote, he was sentenced to death. The soldier tied his limbs with ropes and secured him by the seashore, awaiting the rising tide. This method of execution could be deemed the cruelest torture, as the victim would slowly drown while conscious, making the process excruciatingly prolonged. Listening to the electrician's agonizing cries, Merrick stood solemnly in place, seemingly seeing through everything on the island, everyone being mere playthings of the leaders. Back in the laboratory, Merrick approached his son. Mark, now infected with the virus, had little time left. He revealed the secrets of the island to his son. Initially, there were more than just 513 people living on the island. Lisa was just a supermarket cashier back then, and to control the island's residents, she and her colleagues monopolized food. To survive, 
Everyone had to obey her commands. Under her long-term management, she realized that 513 was a conveniently controllable number. So, she deliberately went to the seaside, extracted virus-infected blood, and then, under the guise of administering vaccines, went to the homes of those who disobeyed, injecting them with the virus. When the men showed symptoms of infection and left their homes, the soldiers waiting outside easily disposed of them. Upon learning all the truths, Mark lost consciousness and collapsed on the laboratory bed. With his only relative gone, Merrick decided to reveal this secret to the public. However, just as he was about to leave the laboratory with the tape, Fiona suddenly burst in from outside. She raised her gun and smashed the tape. It turned out Fiona was a mole sent by Lisa to prevent Merrick from betraying her. They did not realize at that moment that danger was slowly approaching them. It turned out that Jim, who had been expelled by Lisa earlier, had teamed up with the blonde man from the mainland and was launching an attack on the island. 